make a correction here. I'm not really the co-pastor. My wife is the pastor. I'm her unpaid assistant. And I have to do a really good job or I'm afraid she's going to fire me. And uh, also it concerns me that I won't get a good reference. So, wow, legendary men. What a topic. What a topic. Let me share this. There was a time when men were men, real men, men of legendary faith. They rode across the Great Plains with the hope of a better life. They guided wagon trains through the Rocky Mountains in the dead of winter. They drove cattle through the high country and lived off the land. They were men of adventure. They were men of principle. There were others that followed. Men who were legends in their own mind. Yes, men of legendary stupidity. Men, let's not be stupid. God has a great plan. Today I'm going to be talking about legendary faith. What is legendary faith? Now, I had in faith, good faith, um, kind of wanted to get that Western look. And I began to search my house and realized I don't have any cowboy boots. When I look at cowboy boots, look at these toes. My feet aren't shaped like that. I got a footprint like Sasquatch, square. You know, and, and then I searched my house for a neckerchief that like the cowboys wear, and they're all red and, and paisley, and well, this is all I had. And my neck is so fat, I had to tie two of them together, and it's white. You know, I thought about it. White is the flag they wave when they surrender, right? That's not really good. And hat. This is the closest thing I can get to a cowboy hat. It, it's not 10 gallon. I, I really think it's about three and a half quarts. So I'm just not a real cowboy. But I realize even though I'm not a real cowboy, I can have legendary faith and so can you. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Legendary faith. We're hoping for God's blessing, and we believe he's going to bless our lives. We believe that he has a tremendous plan for us, but we have not seen it yet. None of us have really seen the fulfillment of God's plan. We live with a confidence that if we follow him and make decisions based on his word, that plan will be fulfilled in our lives, and we will live in the hope and blessing that is reserved for us. Our problem as men, for some strange reason, we become stupid. Ask our wives, yes. We step out of God's plan sometimes. We make decisions contrary to what the word advises us to do. And yet we expect those same blessings. A good friend of mine, Mark Batterson, says this. You are only one defining decision away from a totally different life. So true. While life has its share of disappointments, many men look back and say, if I'd only made a different decision, my life would be different. If I would have only treated my wife better, if I'd have not been so prideful, if I'd have spent more time with my kids, if I would not have been so stubborn, if I'd have done a better job at work, if I wouldn't have tried to cut corners, if I wouldn't have argued with everyone, if only I would have apologized, if only I would have read God's word more, if only I would have spent more time in prayer, if only I would have made a different decision. When we hit that big crossroads in life, we must make that big decision. How do we know we're going to make the right one? Making the right big decision is easier whenever we've made a lot of little right decisions in our lives. Not many men become legends and have legendary faith. 
because they've made some big, glorious God decision. No, they become legends and have legendary faith because they've made hundreds of little decisions throughout their life to follow his word. And that's what it takes. We're going to be looking at the life of Joseph, a man of legendary faith. Now that encompasses about 10 chapters in Genesis, Genesis chapter 37 to 46. And you need to go home and read that. It is one tremendous, adventurous redemption story. And it is a man's story, the life of Joseph. I'm going to give you in a nutshell what has taken place. I can't read that all this morning. I'd completely be out of time. But this is my quick synopsis of the life of Joseph. At 17 years old, he brags to his brothers about being superior to them. He was his dad's favorite child, and his brothers sold him into slavery. Joseph was taken to Egypt where he was a slave for Potiphar. He soon became the number two man in Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and he ran. She falsely accused Joseph, and he ended up in prison. He became the number two man in prison under the warden. At age 28, he interpreted dreams of Pharaoh's imprisoned servants. At age 30, he interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams and was put in charge of the storehouses of Egypt. There were seven years of plenty where Joseph stored grain, and there were seven years of famine where Joseph sold the grain to the starving masses. It was at this time that Joseph revealed himself to his brothers and forgave them when they came to buy grain. My message today only has one point. It's not a three-point sermon or a two-point or a five-point. One point I need you to walk away with and remember. One and one point only. There's nothing on the screen about it. You just put this in your mind and put it in your heart. The point is this. As men, we need to never tire of doing the right thing thing and making the right decisions. We must never tire of making the right decisions for God. Now let's go back to the beginning of this story when Joseph was only 17. His brothers were out working in the field, taking care of the flocks, feeding, feeding them, trying to find fields to graze and trying to find water and fending off wild animals. And what did Joseph do? He was his father's favorite. Dad sends him out to check on his brothers and report back. And being 17 and not having a fully developed brain, he brings his father a bad report on his brothers. His father loves him and gives him this special robe. It's an elaborate ornamental robe. And being 17 and not swift of mind, he probably shows it off to his brothers. Look at this, guys. Look at what I'm wearing. Dad gave this to me. You don't have one like this. Oh, his brothers are outraged. They couldn't stand him. Plus, he gave a bad report on them. They plotted together. They heard this dream of his, and they plotted together. And in his dream, he talks about putting together sheaves of wheat. And he says, guys, all your sheaves of wheat bowed down and worshiped my sheaves of wheat. So they planned to do him in. They throw him in a dry cistern in the desert. They take his robe and put on animal blood. And they give the robe to the father. And in the meantime, they saw these slave traders coming through. And they, they sold their brother Joseph to the slave traders. And their father Jacob sees this robe covered in blood and believes a wild animal has killed his son Joseph. They, this was in the area of Dothan. And they take Joseph to Egypt. It's about 250 miles. Now, they're not going to let him ride a donkey. They don't put him on a motorcycle or a car. Wasn't invented yet. They don't put them on a camel because they're loading their animals with spices to sell and goods to sell. So Joseph had to walk. How long does it take to walk 250, 300 miles in the desert in the sand? Yeah, I'll tell you how long. You only do about 20 miles a day at the most. Walking in sand is two steps forward and one step back. Joseph had about 12 or 13 days to think about his past decisions. Perhaps he said things like this to himself. Man, I should have not told my brothers about my dreams. I told my the family they're going to worship me. That was a bad idea. I should not have given my dad such a bad report about my brothers. I should not have been such a show off with that coat dad gave me. I'm beginning to think I made some poor decisions. Yeah, you're right, Joseph. You're in slavery. 
In those 12 or 13 days, Joseph did a lot of growing up. I believe he regretted his poor decisions. And being a good Hebrew boy, he probably asked God to help him make better future decisions. Having legendary faith means we need to make the right decisions and never tire of it. That prepares us to make the right decision when the big one comes along. He was stripped of his ornamental robe and thrown in that cistern. He pleaded for his life, the Bible says, and his brothers ignored his misery. You see, it was too late. He had already messed up. So now he is sold in Egypt to Potiphar's household. He's a slave. He makes a decision to be obedient, to do his best, to work hard, and it helps him make a big decision later on. Joseph was a slave. He just uh, just didn't do what he had to do to get by so he didn't get whipped. And he didn't just sit there and feel sorry for himself. Oh, what a miserable job I have. I'm cleaning the bathrooms. I have no prestige. I'm low man on the totem pole. I didn't get paid enough and everyone's advancing but me. No, that wasn't his attitude at all. He worked hard. He did his best. He gave his all. Gave his all. You know, I want to be like that. I want to end my day saying I gave my best to my family. I gave my best to my boss. I gave my best to God and my church. I want to be like Joseph. Now, I don't want to be a slave. So don't tell my wife I said that, okay? But I want to be like Joseph. I think he went to bed at night knowing he gave his best. And God honors that. Potiphar would not put him in charge of everything he owned if he was a slacker. Joseph was no slacker. He became the number two under Potiphar. Men, you want legendary faith? Then believe God has a plan for your life. And he wants to honor you and promote you even when you don't see it. Don't be a slacker at work. Don't be a slacker at home. Serve your children, serve your wife, serve your church. Don't be legendary stupid. Have legendary faith. Legendary faith starts with bringing your wife flowers when you're upset with her. It starts with loving your children and spending time with them instead of being selfish and playing golf every Saturday. And you can substitute the word golf for fishing, hunting, motorcycling, bicycling, kayaking, sleeping on the lazy boy, or whatever it is you love to do. Legendary faith is making little decisions and never getting tired of doing what is right. I want to share with you today two examples, two examples of legendary stupidity. One of the men lives in Pennsylvania the other in Massachusetts, and I personally know their families very well. The man in Pennsylvania was mean and emotionally abusive to his wife and children for 25 years behind closed doors. Everyone in church thought he was great, but he had a gambling problem, a pornography problem, a drug problem, and a pride problem. His adult children eventually went to the senior pastor and told him what life was like in their home and asked him to intervene. The pastor connected with the husband and the father and said, you need to repent. You need to apologize to your wife, apologize to your children. You need to repent. God wants to change your life. And these are the words he uttered back. I'm tired of doing the right thing. He was not a man of legendary faith. He was a man of legendary stupidity. The man from Massachusetts, married 28 years, has a beautiful wife, a wonderful and caring woman, three wonderful adult children. That man would criticize every pastor and every leadership team in every church they ever attended. He made it impossible for his wife to enjoy any church family and to be involved. One day, he played the lottery. This is a true story. He won a million dollars. He comes home from work and tells his wife, the marriage is over. On the way home, I was praying, and God told me, I've been released from you. It was found out a few weeks later he was having an affair with a woman much younger than himself. This supposed man of God divorced his wife and moved in with this young woman. I'm sure having $2 million had nothing to do with this 20-something woman being attracted to this frumpy 60-year-old man. 
He divorced his wife, moved in with his new girlfriend. And within a year, he was broke. He spent all that money. And funny that his new girlfriend left him. She was younger than his own child. When he told his wife the marriage was over, he said these exact same words. I'm just tired of doing the right thing and making the right decisions. Two men who were tired of doing the right thing, tired of making the right decisions, not willing to wait for God's plan to unfold for their lives. They didn't have legendary faith. They had legendary stupidity. God sees and blesses every decision we make. Now it's time for Joseph's big decision, the boss's wife. Potiphar's wife wanted him. It said he was good looking, well built, handsome, and she wanted him to come into her bed. And he refused again and again and again. And one day she grabbed his robe as he ran and she called her servers and said, look, this man made advances to me. I have his cloak. This is the second time that coat got him in trouble. Wow. She tells her husband, and he gets angry with Joseph, and he throws him in prison. In those years, in Potiphar's house, living as God wanted to live, doing the right thing, making the right decisions, turning from sin, we see Joseph is now in a dilemma. Potiphar's wife invited him to come to bed day after day after day. And he didn't say, how could I do such a wicked thing and lose my job? How can I do such a wicked thing and get in trouble? How can I do such a wicked thing and be shamed as a Hebrew? No, he says this. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? That should be the basis of us keeping our lives clean. Not that we're worried about being caught. Not that we're worried about losing our job or losing our marriage. It's about sinning against God. That should be the basis for our lives. He knew it wasn't right to sleep with another man's wife. We don't know how old he was at this time, but he, was, he entered into the slavery at Potiphar's house at age 17. So probably for the next five, six, seven years, he was there before he went to prison. So there you are, a man in age from 17 to 20. He was in his best prime physical shape. His hormones had to be raising, raging. I know when I was 17, my hormones were raging. How about yours? He was good looking, desired. I'm sure he desired to have a sexual relationship with someone who was his wife, not Potiphar's wife. And yet he still, although all that was happening in his life, he refused to sin against God. He made the right decision to wait, to wait for what God wanted. Little did Joseph realize making that right decision was going to cost him dearly. He's a man of legendary faith. He had the confidence and assurance that God had a plan for his life, a great plan, even though he couldn't see it at the time. And now he's in prison, and he has another decision to make. Am I going to just sit here and feel sorry for myself and rot away? Or am I going to serve well in prison? Can I do the right thing and have the right attitude and serve the warden the best I can? Making all those right decisions blessed his life. And pretty soon the warden made Joseph the number two man under him in prison. It said the warden didn't care about anything because Joseph ran everything. Legendary faith isn't quitting your job and going to Africa or China and uh, running an orphanage or winning thousands of people to Jesus. Legendary faith, men, starts where you're at right now, right in that seat. You see, if you can't do the little things and make the little decisions for God, you'll never have an opportunity to make the big decisions for God. If you can't make little decisions well, you'll never make big decisions well. For 13 years, Joseph served as a slave to Potiphar and a slave in the prison. For 13 years, he exhibited legendary faith, but he was not a legend at all. He was a slave and a prisoner. Daily decisions to do the right thing and pursue legendary faith always pays off in the end.
Whoever said good guys finish last did not know what they were talking about. Good guys don't finish last. They may have to wait for that, that hope and that dream to come true, but they don't finish last. Joseph knew God had a plan, and he was willing to wait for that plan to come through. In prison at age 28, he interpreted dreams of the Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker. It took two years for one of them to remember him. Two more years. And then he was finally called into Pharaoh's court to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. You might remember those dreams. The dreams, he had two dreams. One predicted seven years of plenty, and one predicted seven years of famine. Now, after Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he told Pharaoh what he needed to do. He needed to appoint somebody to, to go and to, and to gather all the grain and store it up for seven years in storehouses. And when the famine comes, that person can relinquish the grain as needed so the people of Egypt and the people of this world don't die. Now, Joseph remained humble. He could have said to Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh, I'm pretty good. I can do this job. You need to hire me. I'm the man for you. But he didn't. He didn't do that at all. In his humbleness, he told Pharaoh to find someone. He learned that legendary faith has confidence and assurance that God will bless even when you don't see it. You see, it's God's blessing and God's timing. And that's what we men sometimes don't understand. I love Pharaoh's words here. Pharaoh says this, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph becomes the number two in Egypt. Imagine that. From slavery to prison to the number two under the Pharaoh. From age 17 to 30. Wow. Now we never see in scripture Joseph ever sharing his dreams with anybody from that point on when he was 17 until he gets into Pharaoh's court. We never see him telling Potiphar. We never see him telling other slaves. We never see him telling them prisoners that, you know, someday my brothers and family are going to worship me. No, he never does that. I believe he probably forgot about that dream. He probably thought he'll never see his family again. He never expected it. From age 17 to 30, 13 years in Egypt as a slave and a prisoner, and now it's almost like he's a king himself, the number two under Pharaoh. Where there are seven years of plenty, and they harvest the grain, and Joseph builds warehouses, and they store the grain in it, because seven years of famine are coming next. Two years into the famine, and Joseph's brothers show up. Because their family is starving. There's a famine across the land. And they're sent to buy grain to feed their family. He had not seen his brothers now for 22 years. They bow before him and ask to buy grain. 22 years of having legendary faith before the dream comes true. And some of us get mad because our wife doesn't change in three days. <laughs> and after two months of hard work, we've not gotten that promotion yet. And my neighbor is a Harley, why not me? And my brother-in-law go to the Super Bowl, but my wife said, we can't afford it. Give me a break. Joseph waited 22 years to see God's plan come through. <sighs> True legendary faith takes time to cook. Now, Jamie mentioned this. I have a hobby of smoking meat. I know it's weird, but it's me. I smoke ribs, and I make great ribs. I smoke salmon that I catch myself. I smoke pork butts, chicken wings, and the ultimate, I smoke the Thanksgiving turkey. If you've ever ate smoked turkey, you know what they're going to serve at the marriage supper of the lamb. Yes. When I make pulled pork, I put that pork butt in the smoker for 12 hours. It takes time. Legendary faith takes time to cook in our lives. There are times when it takes more faith to trust God and live daily without seeing, the, seeing God work that miracle than it does to trust God and experience that miracle. 
My first wife of 32 years died of cancer 12 years ago. It required more faith for me to move on in life and can continue to make the right godly decisions than it would have taken to have faith for that healing. That's just my personal experience. Sometimes living the life takes legendary faith. Now what about those two legendary idiots I told you about? One in Pennsylvania, one in Massachusetts. They got tired of doing the right thing, making the right decisions. They threw away a 25 and a 28-year-old marriage and family. They were tired of pursuing their legendary faith. Neither one of them have a relationship with their children or their grandchildren. What a shame. One of them, their granddaughter, has turned 17 and has never met her grandfather. Imagine if those men would have made the right decisions, had done the right things. Imagine what God could have done in their lives if they pursued a legendary faith. It's not that hard. I married my first wife in 1979, and I will admit, I was stupid. Yes, not for marrying her. That was the best decision I made. But I was a young adult male, age 20, and my brain wasn't fully developed. I was a legend in my own mind, so I thought. I learned to listen to my wife. I allowed her and the Holy Spirit to shape my life and to mold me into what I am. I began to make a lot of little choices to be the husband that God wanted me to be and to be the father God wanted me to be and to be the man of God he wanted me to be. I was fortunate. I had a father-in-law who was a pastor, and he mentored me. I left Pittsburgh at age 30, and I traveled a 1,000 miles to my first ministry experience, which was a very difficult experience. But because I made a lot of small decisions to do the right thing, I was able to make some big decisions to do the right thing. At age 32, I started Central Bible College, and you see, all I ever wanted to do was be a children's pastor. I didn't have any other aspirations. I just wanted to reach and teach children about Jesus. After nine years as a children's pastor, I was invited to go to the district office and oversee the Christian education program. I spent the last 22 years in the greatest ministry I ever could. When I retired last April, I was surprised I was honored at a retirement luncheon for our pastors at our district council. Over 200 pastors were there. So many people said so many nice things. I, I, I was overwhelmed. I was, in, I was in tears. I was treated like a man of legendary faith, but that was never my goal. My goal in life was to make the right decisions and please Jesus and serve others. That was my goal. In doing so, I had the confidence and insurance that God was going to do something with my life, even if I didn't see it. Would you stand with me as we close? I'm going to ask our worship team to return. Perhaps you're here today and you don't see yourself as a man of legendary faith. Well, let me tell you, that's not how God sees you. He sees the potential in you to be men of legendary faith. You don't need to have a high IQ. You don't need to have a six-pack and 32-inch biceps. You don't need to have a high-paying job or a big promotion or a big title. All you need from this day forward is to make the right decisions according to God's word for your life. Perhaps you're like 17-year-old Joseph or a young George Krebs. Perhaps you're saying, you know, I've made some stupid mistakes. Well, that's the past, not the future. God has a new plan that starts today and it starts new every day for you. If you need a chance to start over for the first time, today is your day. Joseph spent years as a slave thinking how he needed to change. I believe the Holy Spirit has already told you what you need to do as I spoke this morning. Well, it took Joseph 12 or 13 days to travel from Dothan to Egypt. It's going to only take you about 30 seconds to travel from your seat to this altar. Now is the time for you to begin making the right decisions. And for many of you, your first right decision is to leave your seat and come down here and say, God, I want to be a man of legendary faith. I'm inviting you down now. 
as the worship team plays. Acknowledge that your past is past and God has a future for you. These altars are open for the next 10 minutes. Don't be afraid to step out and say, God, I want to be a man of legendary faith. I'm inviting you down and we'll pray for you. Let God change your life. Let him make you a man of legendary faith.